Okay, then. Perhaps we could make a start. I have two apologies. One is the quality of my voice at the moment. I don't know what's happened to it. It's not all that good. And secondly, um, I have to finish exactly at two today because I have to go to a graduation at King's College down at the Barbican. So I'm going to have to beat a hasty retreat, I'm afraid, at the end of the talk. Now, the, um, the, the, the aim of this whole series of lectures, which spans three years, as you know, is to look at the relationship between liberalism and religion. And in the first series of lectures, I looked at the relationship between economic liberalism and the role of religion and looked at issues like freedom, choice, uh, social justice, and so on. And th this, uh, this present series of lectures are to do more with the relationship between the legal and political framework of liberalism and uh, religious uh, belief. And of course, I'm having to uh, set out this kind of argument in a fairly stark way, because in the amount of time available, I can't look, you know, go, go down every nook and cranny uh, that opens up as you're uh, going, going down this particular road. But I think what I've got to say would be endorsed by many liberal political thinkers, uh, uh, although some might well disagree with some of it. But one useful way of trying to uh, look at liberal political and legal arrangements and, as it were, their follow-through in relation to religion is to concentrate, uh, first of all and briefly, on the idea of pluralism. This idea, which I talked about before, is the idea that um, our values, our ideas about human fulfilment, human flourishing and so forth, these, we differ about these values um, and we, we may well regard them as just matters of choice, as uh, purely subjective values. Um, and this is a fairly um, modern uh, kind of occurrence in the history of Western European states, which were for a very long period dominated by a particular uh, and single value framework, namely that derived from Christianity, whether in its Roman Catholic or its various Protestant forms. But um, we are much more pluralistic than that now. We don't have a kind of authoritative doctrine that the state should be endorsing and facilitating. There are a wide range of different understandings of human values and what those values are and what they uh, demand from us. And that liberalism in some ways is an accommodation to that diversity of points of view, that diversity of values. And on, on the liberal view of the state, it's not the job of the state and government to pursue a particular and in a pluralist society contested view of the good or what makes life worthwhile, but rather to provide a framework within which individuals can use their own resources of intelligence and insight and so on to uh, form their own conceptions of the good and to follow them through so long as in doing so they don't interfere with the freedom of others to do precisely the same kind of thing. So a liberal state is what, um, it's quite a useful term, so I will use it, although it's a, a, a bit of a t term of art, is a nomocratic state, that is to say, a state which rests upon a set of rules as opposed to a telocratic state, which is one that rests on the idea of there being certain uh, fundamental goals, that the st moral goals, as it were, that the state should endorse and embody in its legislation. One is looking towards the state pursuing an idea of the good. The other is about a framework of rules which will best enable individuals to pursue their own conception of the good, whatever it might be. And because we differ in the view of liberals, because we differ in our values, 
the only way of dealing with this diversity is to follow, using the phrase of John Rawls, to, to, we, we have to follow the injunction of putting the right before the good. What we need is the justification of a set of rules, the framework within which individuals can then pursue their own good in their own way, not putting the good before the right because we disagree about what the good is. So the assumption is we do disagree about the good, about what gives value and meaning to life, but we can still, despite that, arrive at some agreed consensus about what the framework of rules should be within which uh, individuals pursue uh, their own conception of the good. And lying behind that idea is the idea that one of the fundamental values of liberalism itself, and this is something I'll be coming back to later on in the lectures, is that of autonomy and choice. That pluralism isn't just something to be coped with, it's something to be certainly recognised and even celebrated because it is the exercise of human autonomy, the human capacity for choice and so forth, that we are able to entertain and pursue different views of what gives value and meaning uh, to life. And because of this, um, the rules that govern a liberal society must be capable of being justified independently of any particular conception of the good, whatever it might be. It might be a, a religious conception of the good, it might be a scientific conception of the good. The rules, though, have to be justifiable without invoking any controversial and disputed claim about what the nature of the good life is. The rules must be capable of being justified independently of that because the whole point of having the rules is to provide the framework within which people can actually pursue whatever their view of the good life is. And typically, this set of rules will be construed as a set of rights, that individuals have rights to do this, that and the other, um, and that the, those rights, taken as a whole, constitute the basic set of rules of a liberal society. And with those rights go obligations, in that if I have a right to X, then you have an obligation not to interfere with my exercise of that right. And the same is true of me in relation to you. If you have a right to Y, then I have an obligation to abstain from preventing you getting Y, so long as um, it, it, it's not a harmful thing to me. So on, on this view, the basic building blocks of a liberal state are rights and the corresponding uh, obligations. And this connects to another very important thing, as we'll see in a few minutes, about the role of religion in a liberal state. It connects to the idea of the rule of law, that the rule of law is central to a liberal view of the political and legal order. And by that, it means that everyone in a society is equal before the law. Um, and in a sense, the, the law is a, a universal within that society. It applies to everybody indiscriminately and equally. And this, of course, is one of the first challenges to uh, a religious outlook, because the idea of many people in, in the churches and so forth is to look for exemptions from the general rule of law uh, in, in relation to their own privileges and immunities. Uh, and, and there are all sorts of cases in the UK which sort of illustrate that, that p individuals or groups have sought to have some kind of exemption from the general rule of law to protect their pursuit of their own particular conception of the good, one which isn't necessarily shared by a majority of others in society. So, 
I mean, t taking a series of examples rather at random, it could be the Catholic adoption agencies uh, wanting to have an exemption from rule that all adoption agencies should be prepared to place ch children uh, with uh, gay couples as well as heterosexual couples. Uh, and uh, that, that the attempt was made to secure an exemption from the general law in that respect. Or it might be, uh, to take a very recent one in relation to gay marriage, uh, that Parliament decided when the gay marriage legislation went through that no exemption would be given to registrars who may well have taken on their jobs before gay marriage came in, but that didn't mean that they could be exempt from the requirement that they should perform uh, gay um, ceremonies. And um, this, this has recently been reinforced by the courts only a couple of weeks ago. It went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decided that this exemption, which Parliament hadn't granted, but there was no way that such an exemption was going to be granted. So one of the features of the rule of law which rests upon the idea of individual rights and the protection of individual rights it has, has been the, the idea that the rule of law should as far as possible be preserved without making exceptions, without making exemptions. Because the more you go down the road of creating exemptions, the more you will end up uh, creating parallel legal uh, arrangements for different groups of people in society. And this uh, could go quite a long way once the principle of exemption is em embodied in, in the law. Um, so, for example, you might have um, uh, Islamic parallel legal orders in relation to uh, civil law. Um, we already have a parallel legal order in a kind of minor way through the canon law of the Church of England. Um, and we also have, uh, again, in a, well, it's important in the, the context, it's not a minor thing, but it's, it, it's not of a, a, a general great, great concern with there's the uh, a similar parallel legal order for the Jewish community. And the liberal tends to want to say at this point that we should be, we being the citizens of a liberal society, should be civic egalitarians. That is to say, we should treat everybody before the law in exactly the same way and not seek uh, exemptions and not to give uh, legal recognition uh, to exemptions. Now this, of course, uh, has a pretty direct effect on uh, religious um, practices of one sort or another. And uh, the, church, the, the churches have this, these exemptions in some respects. So um, it, it wouldn't be discriminatory to um, appoint only a Roman Catholic to be the priest in charge of a Catholic church. Um, and similarly for Anglican arrangements and also things like Catholic schools and Anglican schools can uh, restrict um, an appointment to a particular uh, set of religious views or beliefs. Uh, but that is uh, about as far as it goes, really, since the passing of the Human Rights Act in 1998, which came law, law in 2000, and the Equalities Act of uh, 2010. And what we've got now is um, something rather similar to what I suggested in a wholly theoretical way, uh, is central to liberalism, that is to say, a set of laws which define basic rights and define uh, basic forms of uh, illegitimate discrimination. So the Human Rights Act, if you like, embodies a set of basic rights and the Equalities Act embodies a set of uh, uh, protections for p 
people under particular descriptions. So, uh, for example, gender, sexuality, um, uh, ethnicity, um, and so on, and also, uh, in, in a way, religion as well. Um, so there, if you put those two pieces of legislation together, you've got the beginnings of this kind of framework of basic law um, to do with individual rights, which, the, which religious communities have to live with, and they have to live within those legal uh, principles, that, that legal uh, framework. And this, of course, has led, as I said earlier, in relation to the Catholic adoption agencies or um, whatever, to a number of uh, rather awkward cases. Uh, another one that was decided in the Supreme Court just recently was the, um, the, the one where a, 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 a couple in Northern Ireland who ran a guest house in their own home um, wouldn't let a... Uh, um, a, a, a double bedroom to a gay couple and they were found to be in breach of the law all the way up through the legal system right up to the uh, Supreme Court. Um, so people have to live within this framework of rights and that framework of rights is to be regarded as universal within the society with only the most modest uh, sort of um, accommodations towards the position of uh, religion and uh, religious um, um, life. And of course, one of the things that the framework of rights does is actually to protect religion itself. It does this through the, in, in the Human Rights Act, which incorporates most of the European Convention on Human Rights. It embodies the principle of an absolute freedom of religious belief in Article 9. And religious identity is protected through the Equalities Act. But I'll come back to that in a minute because it hasn't turned out to be all that satisfactory. But the problem with the present situation, uh, which you know, has been clear for a very long time, we wait before the Human Rights Act, is that religious belief doesn't just, uh, isn't just confined to, as it were, some kind of internal assent to a set of views or propositions or um, whatever, but rather involves practice, involves some kind of public behaviour which is required by your religion. Now, some religions require this in a much more overt way than others. So to be a Muslim man, you have to pray five times a day. That is a requirement of the religion. So if you can't pray five times a day or you choose not to pray five times a day, then you are not, as it were, a, uh, a, 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 um, a strict uh, Muslim or someone with integrity over his or her uh, faith. So uh, there is the issue of how do you deal with um, the exercise of religion or what the lawyers call the manifestation of religion. There's a difference between being encouraged to do various things by a religious community like stand on a street corner to try to convert people. But that isn't a requirement but it is encouraged by some religion, religious denominations. But there are other forms of religious activity that are required, like praying five times a day. And the problem is this, that um, they, if you say, well, we've got to constrain that exercise of religious freedom, like praying five times a day, we've got to limit that, to, I mean, say in the workplace or whatever, then it's not clear whether you are really still protecting the idea of the absolute right to freedom of religious belief because you are preventing that person from doing something that is integral uh, to the religion, not something that's just 
uh, you know, regarded as a, a good idea if it can be done, but it's something integral to it. So to restrict the exercise of religion when that exercise is to do with something that is internal or integral or required by the religion, that could be regarded as an infringement of freedom of religion, which is supposed to be, under the European Convention, an absolute right. So there's a bit of a tangle there, but I want to come on to that in the next lecture when I'm going to be talking more about the idea of identity, uh, particularly religious identity, and freedom of speech, and so on. Um, so I don't want to get too diverted on that particular road uh, for, the, for the moment. And if you, but, but if you do go down that road to pick up the issue of the rule of law that I was talking, to, talking about a minute or two ago, the rule of law becomes extremely difficult to understand if there are different legal orders, if there are different requirements on different groups within society, because some people uh, would be subject to the rule of law and other people wouldn't because there is an exemption for them in terms of their religious or cultural beliefs and so forth. So if you're going to stick to the idea of the rule of law, you can see why lawyers and members of parliament and so forth are not keen on the idea of granting exemptions from whatever the legislation requires for everybody else. And that's a very important uh, thing. So, given this framework of uh, rules and um, requirements and obligations and rights, um, how are we to understand how religious belief um, fits into this? Well, one thing uh, that might be, one argument that's made, uh, it's made by um, Bernard Williams, an ex-Cambridge philosopher who died of, of probably eight, eight or nine years ago, and the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas. What one th theme that they both have is that in fact, the liberal setup, as it were, the rights, obligations, rule of law, um, imposes much greater costs on a religious citizen than it imposes on a secular citizen. Um, the psychological cost of living in a society where your religious beliefs are, as it were, consigned to the private world and that you cannot expect the public world to somehow recognise through something like an exemption or an accommodation the essential nature of what you regard as being crucial to your religion, that that, um, that, that, that sort of situation imposes much greater costs on a on a, um, a religious adherent than uh, are imposed upon a non-religious citizen. I'll just quote a very short passage from uh, Bernard Williams uh, just to make this point, but it's also found in um, a debate actually between Jürgen Habermas and uh, Pope Benedict before he became Pope Benedict. But this is what Bernard Williams says. And this is from his book, uh, Moral Luck. There can come a point, he says, at which it is quite unreasonable for a man to give up in the name of the impartial ordering of the world of moral agents, something which is a condition of having any, any interest in being around in the world at all. Now, that may seem a bit sort of uh, obscure, but the, the, that he's arguing it's unreasonable to expect, say, a religious person, which Bernard Williams wasn't, but it's unreasonable to expect a religious person with strong convictions to subordinate his or her way of life, his or her judgment, 
to the requirements of what he calls the impartial ordering of the world of moral agents, that is to say, the rule of law, the universality of rights and obligations as embodied in the rule of law, that a religious citizen will find living according to the rule of law much more irksome in a liberal society than will a secular uh, citizen. And I think that that's certainly true as a statement of fact, and you can think of other cases uh, recently where someone has tried to express their religious belief in some kind of public practice and has um, found the going very difficult. I mean, the NHS nurse who offered to pray uh, for someone uh, in her care um, was very severely disciplined by the hospital in which she worked. Uh, the relate counsellor recently who declined to give marriage guidance counselling to a gay couple, he was sacked. And again, the courts upheld that sacking as being per perfectly legitimate because we shouldn't be making exceptions uh, for people uh, for the reasons that I've stated about the rule of law, about the universality of the rule of law. So the, the argument is that a liberal society ought to be even-handed between all its citizens. But in fact, the costs of living in a liberal society for a religious person are far, far higher than they are for a non-religious person, according to this argument. Now, the problem with that is that, uh, it, 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 is that you could argue, and this, this certainly has been argued by uh, philosophers and theologians, that, uh, or a debate between philosophers and theologians, I suppose, it, it, is, uh, that they could have argued as follows. Having a religious belief in a liberal society is no different from having an expensive taste. Let's say, you know, my, my taste is for champagne and caviar two or three times a day and so forth. And uh, I don't expect uh, other people to make accommodations to my expensive tastes, tastes which I, are a matter of choice and tastes which I can easily disavow if I want to. And having a religious outlook, having a religious belief and acting on that belief is like having an expensive taste. And why should the state, as it were, count out to groups and individuals who have something that is very similar to an, to an expensive taste? Well, that would then turn on the question of how do you draw a distinction between an expensive taste and something like uh, religion? Well, one thing you might say is that, um, first of all, the expensive taste in the example that I gave uh, is purely a matter of choice and preference and you can give it up without any great costs and so forth. Whereas a religious belief, if it becomes an onerous thing in a liberal society, it cannot just be dispensed with in quite that way. And it might be wrong in any case to regard from the point of view of those who are adherents to it, it might be quite wrong to regard their beliefs as in any sense a matter of choice or preference. Um, that the liberal tends to take the view, and this again is something that I'll be discussing another, in another lecture, but the liberal tends to take the view um, that what is good is a matter of choice for an individual, and it's the act of choosing that makes it a good for that individual. Whereas many people, I think, who are on the religious side of this argument won't in fact recognise that. A, a description of how they understand uh, the nature of their belief, um, that, that the belief is somehow uh, much deeper 
than just a preference for X over Y. It's not just to be seen as a sheer matter of choice that rights uh, protect. It, it's to be seen as something else. But what is the else that we, we, we would have to invoke in order to block the argument that a taste for religion is just like an expensive taste for caviar and the rest of us shouldn't uh, be bothered about it. Um, we, you know, we're not going to make accommodations or exemptions to a taste for caviar and champagne. There's no reason why we should make accommodation and exemption for a set of religious beliefs either. Well, the obvious answer to that question um, is, it, it, it's obvious, but it's also much more problematic than it seems, would be to say that, well, religious beliefs are, in a sense, about ultimate things or the most basic things that you can be concerned about, the nature of human life, the nature of death, uh, the nature of God, uh, and, and so on and so forth, that these are, in some sense, ultimate beliefs, whereas a taste for caviar is a kind of passing desire. But my, my sort of embracing uh, a religious outlook is something quite different from just being a matter of taste, and that people's ultimate commitments should be protected. They should be recognised and protected, and we shouldn't impose extra psychological costs on them, and hence there should be an accommodation for people's ultimate beliefs. Now, the problem with that is that if you leave it at that, it can look a fairly straightforward argument, but, but there are two issues that arise. One is, what about someone's ultimate belief that is actually is not related to religion at all? but might be regarded as a belief by which that person lives his or her life. And it might, for example, be a deep belief about the racial superiority of white people. Or it might be anything of that sort, something that is central to your own belief system. And if you say people's ultimate beliefs, their basic beliefs, their fundamental beliefs, should be protected, we have no ground really for thinking uh, that, um, that these beliefs will be benign. They might be quite the opposite. Um, and we wouldn't, I assume, want to be giving um, exemptions and um, accommodations to beliefs of that sort. Now, why not? Well, you might say, and this brings the argument to a full circle, you might say well, the reason why not is that it infringes basic rights to give an accommodation or an immunity or a privilege to beliefs about the superiority of white people over black people. Um, and in those circumstances, what you're doing is importing a liberal standard about basic rights to say, well, an ultimate belief that we will make an accommodation with or an ultimate belief that we will give an immunity to has to be a belief that fits into the framework of basic rights which have been set out in basic doc doc doctrines like the Human Rights Act or the Equalities Act and so on. So in, it, you can't just say that we can accommodate or give immunity to ultimate beliefs without those beliefs being tested against the standard of something like a liberal set of rights. But then you're back where you started from, um, which was I mean, how does religion fit into this general set of rights? Well, it doesn't unless it conforms to that set of rights. If you like, the only form that um, religion can, can have a place in the sun, if you like to put it that way, in a liberal society, is to be a liberalised form of that religion, whatever it might be, whether it's 
Christianity or Judaism or whatever, that, that it would have to be a liberalized form of the religion if you want to be able to push the argument, look, this is an ultimate belief, and therefore there should be an accommodation to it, as Bernard Williams was suggesting, there should be an accommodation to it, but that accommodation will only happen if it is a liberalized form of that set of religious beliefs, that is to say, conforming to the basic set of rights and obligations set out for us, at least in this country, and it's different in other countries, but uh, set out in the European Convention on Human Rights, incorporated through the Human Rights Act and um, the Equalities Act. So the argument then would be, yes, you can have an accommodation to an ultimate belief, but only if that ultimate belief is consistent with the requirements of uh, treating other people according to something like uh, the Human Rights Act or the Equalities Act or, or both. So is that all there is to a kind of liberalised form of religion? Well, this has worried, um, this is a question that's worried um, people who, who write about this for, for, for a, a good length of time, and it's, the, the worry would go something like this, um, that... Excuse me a minute. Um, that if you are to, if, if your belief system is to be consistent with liberal, legal and political principles, then you, you have to hold that belief in what you might call a reasonable way, or if you like, a liberal way, because it's very much the same thing. And what does it mean to hold your religious beliefs in a reasonable way? Well, according to, I mean, the philosopher who's written most about this is John Rawls, the American philosopher. Um, but according to him, um, a reasonable belief is one in which the believer certainly has a strong belief in whatever it is, but equally recognizes that it's reasonable for other people to disagree with him or her. That I, I might have full confidence in my own Christian beliefs and I'm prepared to act on them and follow through on them and so forth, but what makes it a reasonable belief is my recognition that it is reasonable for other people to disagree with my beliefs. And if that's so, then my belief would be compatible with um, liberal rights and principles, if you like, because I'm leaving it open for other people to exercise their rights in a way uh, that doesn't take my religious beliefs as being uh, veridical or, or true. Um, so on, on that view, uh, a, a, a liberal way of holding your beliefs is to accept that it's reasonable for other people to disagree with you. And part of that reflects um, an argument that goes back a long way, uh, namely to John Stuart Mill in the middle of the 19th century, uh, who argued that um, even religious people should recognize the virtues of a liberal view of these things because he argues in his essay on liberty uh, that there are three very strong reasons why religious people should take a liberal view of their beliefs. The first is uh, that if their beliefs are taken to be unquestioned and undebated and are somehow, and, and, and your view as a religious person is that the, that the law should reflect these beliefs, then that is an assumption of the infallibility of your beliefs. And yet we have no reason whatsoever to think that beliefs are infallible and history is littered with the demonstrable fallibility of beliefs that were at one time held to be infallibly true. And so if, if we are going to have a sort of um, 
reasonable view of a religious position. We, we need to recognize that the claims of that religion must fall far short of claims to infallibility about this, that, or the other um, activity uh, that we're concerned with. Secondly, he argues that the truth is many-sided, that there isn't just one, that the, the truth about anything, particularly to do with human relationships, is many-sided, and we should be open to alternative views of what the truth is in particular circumstances. So I may be fully religious, I may have no uh, qualms about my own religion, but I m must be able to recognize that other people have something to, to contribute to the issue that my own religious belief is trying to uh, incorporate. And that's very similar to the point I just made about reasonable belief, meaning that it's reasonable for other people to disagree with you. And then thirdly, why a religious person should hold to this kind of view of the truth um, is that it's only if your beliefs are subjected to constant challenge that they will remain as vivid and compelling beliefs for you. That once your beliefs become a kind of an official doctrine or a settled doctrine or a dogma or something like that, then in those circumstances your beliefs will become sort of dead, you'll know them by rote, you'll just perform what's required by those beliefs, again largely as a matter of habit or rote, it's when beliefs are challenged and you have to think up alternatives and rebuttals of those challenges uh, that people actually hold their religious beliefs in a strong and committed way. And he mentions, for example, that the, uh, the, the beliefs of the early church, the Christian church, were much stronger during the period of persecution, say, by the Romans. Uh, than they were in mid-Victorian England, where they precisely turned into a set of habits and uh, rote um, uh, learning and communication and so forth. So Mill says it's actually in the interest of the religious person to embrace a liberal kind of order within which their beliefs will be challenged, but they will equally have a full right to seek to rebut and so forth those challenges. And we shouldn't be giving any kind of accommodation to the religious person. He or she has to fight for the truth of their beliefs in the marketplace of ideas. And that's a jolly good thing, even from the Christian's own point of view, to engage in that, that sort of uh, framework. So. On, on that, that view, um, Mill wants to say that there isn't some, that the liberal political and legal setup isn't something inimical to Christianity or any other religion, but rather it can provide the basis for a, a much more lively kind of uh, Christian faith and Christian belief or, or, or any other faith or belief system. Uh, that, that we might be talking about. So, if we, if it looks from the early part of what I said, and I think this is true, that in a liberal politico legal setup, um, the beliefs and religious practices have to conform to whatever are seen to be the basic rights, duties, and obligations of citizens. But that shouldn't be seen as some kind of terrible Im imposition on us. Because if Mill is right, there are actually strong reasons why adherence to religion should actually, um, well, almost glorify the situation which they're then in, uh, because they will recognize the need always to engage uh, with other people and to seek to convince them and argue with them and so forth. 
Uh, and this is an important moment in the history of uh, how people have thought about uh, religion and a liberal um, society. So, um, the, what the, it's sometimes argued, uh, it's sometimes argued that the, it's a kind of consensus building view of truth. And in a sense, this is slightly counterintuitive that we tend to think that what is true somehow has to be one thing that represents reality. I mean, it, 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 you know, it's true that my left hand is waving about, and it's true because it is waving about. And um, uh, the, 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 any, any truth represents some segment of reality, however trivial, like my waving my hand. But Mill's argument about truth is much more complicated than that, that particularly in terms of relationships and how we are to understand our relationships, the truth is many-sided and different points of view need to be taken into account and perhaps reconciled together in one uh, much more complex uh, whole. Now, of course, there's a great deal um, that can be argued about in, in this, particularly the, the odd position, I just used the word counterintuitive once and I'm going to use it again, uh, that the rather counterintuitive position that liberalism now seems to have got itself into, because liberalism has historically been uh, keen on the idea of an independent, vibrant, voluntary civil society. Uh, and, and of course, churches and religious communities of all sorts would be part of that. But nevertheless, in order to, as it were, make the world safe for these voluntary activities within civil society, there has to be a framework of law which requires people's beliefs to be held in one way rather than another. And isn't that very anti-liberal? The liberal is saying, you won't have a very clear place in a liberal society if you are a fundamentalist. Because if you like, the fundamentalist is precisely the person who says, I know what the truth is, and you're just wrong. Not, I know what the truth is for myself, but I recognize that it's reasonable for you to disagree with me. That's the difference between these two positions. The liberal wants the second of those, that the religious person will engage with the world generally in terms of a reasonable view of what the truth is, not a sort of one-dimensional fundamentalist view of what the truth is. So, but but the, the oddity of this is that the liberal is saying, if you take that one-dimensional fundamentalist view, then you can't engage with liberal society. And what we must do is to liberalize your belief system. But that's a very strange thing for a liberal to try to do, uh, because um, it's, as I say, that liberalism has often portrayed itself as wanting the freedom and diversity of civil society underneath a small state that would give maximum freedom to everybody. But in order to have that religious freedom, and including the freedom to practice the religion, you would have to hold those beliefs in one way rather than another. And that might seem to be a very curious kind of outcome of this sort of argument. But in, in the next lecture, what I want to do is to try to sort of uh, step back a little bit um, in the argument and discuss uh, w w what has become a, a very common kind of argument now that, uh, w that somehow the law should represent and protect uh, people's identities, including their uh, religious identities, and uh, what difference that would make to how religion meshed into a liberal society. Because remember, and I'll finish on this point, 
remember that um, I said earlier that there might be a religious belief that just requires you to behave in a particular kind of way, like praying five times a day. And if that's so, and if that practice is restricted, then you could argue that is a restriction on your religious freedom that is supposed to be an absolute right under the European Convention. So how do you get around that? Well, the judges have taken it upon themselves, not that there was really any alternative, but the judges have taken it on themselves to try and figure out what is and what isn't a requirement of a religion. So that they're keen, obviously, not to restrict the freedom of religious belief, but they may have to deal with the contentious nature of a particular practice. And if they're doing that, they may then want to answer the question, is this practice somehow necessitated by the religion, or isn't it? I mean, it could be anything. I mean, it could be something like um, uh, discriminating against gay people wanting to rent a room from you. It could be methods of slaughter of animals and so forth for food. It, it could be a whole range of things. And are judges in the best position to be able to say what is an intrinsic part of a religion and what isn't? Because it's only by answering that question, it seems, that you can determine whether you're allowing this, pe this person or this community to behave in that way uh, or, or you're restricting that, is that a restriction on their religious freedom or not? Because to restrict an absolute requirement for a religion is to impinge on their religious freedom, which is supposed to be an absolute right. But how do we actually figure out what is supposed to be some kind of intrinsic requirement of a religion? And um, it, there are some fascinating sort of highways and byways to this uh, particular debate that I'll try and take up next time. So there's about 10 minutes, I think, for oh, about eight minutes for questions, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, well, lady there in the red. Thank you. Well, I think the second question is easier to answer than the first. I think the answer is yes, uh, I would have thought. Um, there might be a, you know, a, 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 a margin of appreciation, as lawyers like to say, when you're talking about, say, a 14-year-old or something like that, um, as opposed to an 8-year-old. I mean, it's... Uh, um, but, but in general, I think the answer is uh, yes, they would treat their religious standing as being you know, a vicarious relationship with the parents. Um, and on the first thing, um, th that's much more difficult because, w and I mean, it's always difficult to know how many kind of complications to include in a, a talk, but one of the arguments within liberalism is our rights based upon choice. And if they are, then they can only be held by people who are capable of making those choices. So what about children? And for that matter, what about people who are severely mentally disabled or become um, uh, in a persistent vegetative state because of a stroke or something like that? Do they then lose their rights because the rights are based upon the capacity for choice? So there's a, a question within liberalism about whether you root uh, rights in choice or whether you do something else, which is the one I uh, prefer really, which is to take what, what's sometimes called the interest or benefit theory of rights, that rights are about protecting your interests, your basic interests. 
uh, rather than your choices. And then, of course, children, babies can have basic interests without even knowing that they've got them, um, you know, because you can ascribe interest to people whether they are conscious enough to know that they've got those interests, um, and we do that all the time. Uh, so it depends a little bit on which sort of authority on liberalism you're, you know, you you adhere to. But that would be the issue there about the relationship between rights and choice and how children relate to that. But certainly some liberal thinkers on H. L. A. Hart, who's the doyen in many ways of. Uh, English uh, jurisprudential writing certainly thought that children didn't have rights. Yeah. Towards the end, you started picking up on some of the anomalies. Is your what's the difference between your liberal society and an atheist society? Because I was beginning to sense that. The established church is gone, but now atheism is the new default position, yeah, yeah. and everything must be judged from that point of view. Yeah, and religious yeah. people um, can believe what they like, but they must only exercise that in society insofar as it fits in with the secularist yeah. assumption. Yeah, uh, I, I think there's quite a lot of truth in what you say, although in terms of liberal political and legal theory, uh, it isn't like that um, because, in, in, in terms of the, th you know, the theory, as it were, um, liberalism should not be built upon or indebted to any comprehensive doctrine, whether it's religious or atheistical, uh, because the whole point is we recognise pluralism and diversity, and to elevate a secularist point of view or an atheistic point of view to be the kind of touchstone of a liberal political order is to invoke a comprehensive doctrine and make it the criterion of legitimate action within society as a whole, whereas the whole point of liberalism has been to somehow try and embrace plurality and difference, and that would be driven out by some kind of elevation of secularism, which is as much a comprehensive doctrine about what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, as is a, a religious belief. Uh, it seems to me that um, a major consideration is the relative cost to the yeah. individual yeah. and to society at large. And I give two examples to, to um, show uh, how these contrast. Um, male circumcision. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, the Hindu uh, sooty, mm. uh, where the uh, widow is, is burned. Mm. And in the first case, the uh, disbenefit to society at large, if it takes this, is fairly minimal. Mm. Whereas in the second case, it's mm. absolutely enormous. Mm. Mm. Uh, and it just seems to me to be a question of mm. subjectively balancing these two costs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I can see why you say that, and there's a lot in what you say. But I, I think, though, this raises an issue for, sorry to say this, but for the next lecture, uh, which is, amongst other things, apart from identity, is going to focus a bit on the, the so-called harm principle in terms of what you should and shouldn't tolerate in society. And um, uh, again, uh, uh, another way of putting your point would be circumcision is a relatively minor harm if it's seen as a harm at all, uh, whereas sooty is a pretty major kind of harm. Uh, but should we be going down the road, as I think we should, of saying we will only uh, prohibit those actions uh, which cause harm? Uh, or significant harm or something like that, rather than delving into whether something is or isn't a requirement of a religion. So if you take, uh, it's because it's a fairly simple case in a way, if you take the idea of um, um, wearing a, a burqa, um, 
what one way of looking at this is, well, is that form of dress required by Islam or isn't it? And if it is required, then we can't pre prevent it because that would be an infringement of the freedom of religion. And I think this is quite the wrong way to go myself. I think what we should be looking at is, well, what harm is done by wearing a burqa? And there might be, you know, and we can all have a conversation, a discussion about that, uh, and, and come up with different points of view and so on. But it's an open kind of thing. But if, if the argument is, well, is it or isn't it a requirement of Islam, this makes it a very sort of hermetic kind of discussion about uh, what a religious belief requires or doesn't require. And those of us who know next to nothing about the religious belief in question would then be sort of excluded from the uh, discussion of whether this should be allowed or not allowed. So in, in the, it's just a parallel case to those that you've mentioned. It's a case of you know, harm, which has always been the liberal principle and is in need of being reasserted, in my view, uh, as the principle on which you would then seek to constrain uh, behaviour. I'm terribly sorry, I'm going to have to go. I've, just, I've, I've got a PhD student who's about to graduate at the Barbican and I've just got to be down there, so I'm sorry about that. Okay.